you may be a good accountant, but maybe in 15 years or 10 years, the job of an accountant will have been replaced by technology. So what will you be in that future marketplace? You need to acquire the skills now to succeed in that marketplace. So as I said, let's not use gender or equality or lack thereof to explain why we cannot position ourselves for competitive advantage. I'm a student of strategy, and by the way, I want to make a slight correction. I'll probably graduate this year with a PhD. So I have not yet graduated. And seated across is my classmate. We are doing the course together, and we should graduate this year. We have challenged ourselves to graduate in December this year. So when I come back next year, if you invite me, I'll be Dr. Karone. <laughs> I, I think it sounds good to have a doctor before your name. For those of us who come from Kenya, Article 27 of our Constitution is where what we are talking about today is anchored. It outlaws discrimination and requires all our institutions to extend equal opportunities to both our men and our women. So we have the backing of our Constitution, yet discrimination is still prevalent. Research indicates that if you put more women and girls through school, you will improve the health in our communities and you will enhance the incomes in our homes. The business world has long debated the effect of gender diversity on business outcomes. And Sylvia, who is a business leader, will tell you. Survey has found that organizations with greater diversity perform far better than those that are rigid or exclusive. Institutions with more women in leadership also fare much better, fare much better than those that are dominated by men. This is not my making, this is research. However, the great run of our organizations still employ less women, have little representation of females in decision-making levels, and nearly always pay less for women doing the same job as a man or similar work. So even in incomes, there's still a disparity. An editor, for instance, will probably earn less than their male colleague if they are female. So we must continue to interrogate why it is exactly the same job with exactly the same performance requirements and outcomes. So why is it that we have allowed it to persist for so long? And those of us who lead in these organizations, if we are women, what are we doing? Are we interrogating these things? Are we questioning why it is the way it is? Are we calling for a different approach so that all our women and all our men can feel included in equal measure in what we do? That to discriminate against 50% of your population, because that is what it is. Women, not just in Kenya, but elsewhere in Africa, account for almost 50%, or in some cases more, of the population. So why is it that we are only asking for a third? Inclusion. That's what the Constitution says, but why is it that in practice we can't have a 50-50 representation like we currently saw, recently saw in Ethiopia or in Rwanda? One third is the minimum threshold of the Constitution, but why can we, can we not ask for more? In the organizations you all lead, how many women have corner offices? How many sit in your boards? How many are directors? I am sure in most cases they are less than a third. But why is this the case? Whose fault is it? Or who hasn't done what for us to achieve that equity that we so much look for? The focus globally today is on competitiveness, not just of our organizations, but even in the public sector. We have to be competitive. Technology is disrupting marketplaces internet, technology platforms, farms, are competing in businesses that traditionally our ind industries were competing in. So as women, what do we need? We need to be innovative. We need to be adaptive. 
and we need to work in collaboration. Not just with fellow women, but with other colleagues in the organizations in which we serve. The current business reality, or global reality, requires certain qualities in institutions. It requires a learning quality. We have to be learning organizations. We have to be flexible. We have to be dynamic. And we have to be innovative. Indicators of the qualities that I've just outlined include willingness to listen, not just to different points of view, to different perspectives from our men, from our women. It calls for willingness to disrupt the old method. What we are currently doing, can we disrupt it? I serve at the Ministry of Lands. Our records are 90% manual. And by records, I mean that the records of parcels of land in Kenya. They are physical files. This is 2019. Why do we still have to carry a physical file from one office to another? And you come there and we tell you it is lost. Why? When technology can replace the many manual jobs that we are doing, why is it that we hire low-level skills instead of investing in technology, in, in people that can run technology. Why would we not employ geospatial engineers, GIS experts, people who are able to deal with the future marketplace? My ministry has about 3,000 employees. Half of those are low-level skills. That is something we should disrupt because that is a, a situation that is not tenable even five years from now. Because if the rest of the world is changing and people are transacting business electronically, how can we survive if we are still manual in what we do? So as we sit in our organizations, these are the questions we must continue to ask. It's not easy. 